Okay. And I'll just ask if you're just joining us, if you wouldn't mind very much just popping yourself on to mute please, as well, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, you're very welcome to tonight's talk on gardening for butterflies. Uh, my name's Claire and I'm a director with Green Foundation Ireland, which is organizing today's event. Um, if you're not familiar with Green Foundation Ireland, it's an NGO that aims to create awareness about a sustainable island through education and community projects. And it does this by hosting webinars like this one this evening. For more about the foundation, you can visit this website that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, all right, I'll just put a few more on mute there. I think I can hear some background noise though. Um, great, okay, before kicking off, I'm really just here for the technical introduction. So I'd like to uh, just highlight a few points. I'm, I'm putting everyone on mute. So if you wouldn't mind just staying on mute um, while we have our uh, guest speaker talking, that'd be fantastic. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we're recording the session. It'll all go up on the website, so you can always revisit it afterwards. Please get in touch. You can uh, connect with me directly um, through the chat if you want a private message or using the chat function. Anyway, look, I'm going to have to let you go. I told uh, so, um, so that's that. And um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end as well, and you'll be able to engage and ask anything at all. I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions. So without further ado, I'll hand over to um, Donna, who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. So Donna. Hello everybody, thanks for, thanks for coming along. And um, I mean, the main reason we're recording this is so that you can let other people, other gardening friends know about it and pass on that information to, uh, to people. We're putting together uh, a list of the actions you can do for wildlife. Um, as, as an individual or a, as a community. And um, so we have this on butterflies, uh, we have some, some stuff on, on things you can do for bats, and um, we have, have stuff on, on things you can do along the coastline, um, uh, actions that you can take. So if, if whatever, eventually, and um, we'll, I, I think we should have about probably seven or eight different talks on, on things you can do. So uh, I, I encourage all to just to have a look at them and see what you can do in, in your, your own garden. Um, yeah, so I'd like to introduce Jesmond Harding. He's a, a founder member of Butterfly Conservation Ireland. And I met him at, the, at a talk in uh, Navan several, several years ago. And I was absolutely astonished by, uh, by what he was managing to do in a garden and the amount of species he's man managing to um, attract to the garden. Um, he's also writ written a book. He's a, a, an author of Discovering Irish Butterflies and Their Habitats. Um, and can I just try and get us all to join Butterfly Conservation Ireland? They're a wonderful organisation. Um, I've been shocked myself. I, I, do, uh, I work at, at uh, undertaking bat surveys and I've been surveying for bats. And I'm just absolutely appalled at the lack of insects that I'm finding every night when I go out now. I mean, even last year you go out and you'd be bitten all the time by insects. Um, there really is less and less everywhere. And I particularly in Dublin City is particularly bad. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd be really keen to hear what Jasmine suggests for, for uh, bringing these insects into, into our gardens. What we're going to do is show a video um, uh, and then Jasmine will show a video of his garden. We just were afraid that the weather wasn't going to hold up tonight for him to actually take us around. So he'll show a video and then he will, um, uh, then, then we, we give questions and answers and then he'll show another video. So that's how we'll, we'll work the session. So you might like to take it away there, Jesmond. Are you, are you unmuted there? I think, um, can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, I, okay. Right, I'm just trying to play this, Denise. How do I do it? Just, just this. Hello, Jasmine Harding here from Butterfly Conservation Ireland. I'm on the main road outside my house in Pagestown, Maynooth, in County Kildare, as you can hear. And I'm going to talk to you about how to look after your garden for butterflies. And we're going to start out on the road in front of the house. So we're going to have a look 
at everything from front to back of the garden. Now, as you can see here, you have a weedy patch at the front. And it's, it's a little bit of gravel here, and you can see the plants have seen themselves a little bit. So here we have Oxide Daisy. We have common dog violet. We have our old friend, the common dandelion, which as you can see has gone to seed. We have red clover. We have Herb Robert. You can see this is a feathery, this is actually a geranium. Um, and all of this will be in bloom very shortly. Now, the, the violet has already blossomed and this a succession of flowers will develop here over the season and up against this warm stone wall will create the perfect place for butterflies and at nighttime moths to feed on the nectar because they love a bit of warmth and heat. Now, if you look outside the wall here, just inside the wall, you'll see a native hedge which is actually planted on a raised bed against a retaining wall on the inside and I'm going to show you that now. Now this is a retaining bed here and all of these plants here are native. So this beautiful plant here is Irish white beam, um, Sorbus hibernica, one of our rarest uh, native trees and an endemic species only found in Ireland and various moth species feed on the leaves and as you can see it's the flower buds are swelling nicely so that will blossom soon. Here this plant here and you can see there's a lot of leaf curl in it but that's normal and natural. This is um, Gelder Rose, a Viburnum opulus and this plant here is a native plant. The flowers are beautiful white soup plate type flowers held in like big umbels like this. You can see it's this is the the flower head here. And I was watching the gold crests plucking food from it the other morning and this is also used by native um, moth species. This here is another native. This is yew and um, again, na a few native moth species use it. This plant here is another kind of rare shrub or tree. Um, this is alder buckthorn, and this is used by the brimstone butterfly and also by the emperor moth and the tissue moth and a few other species and for breeding. So I'm gonna take you just along here. This is common holly. You can see there's a flower there and the holly blue butterfly lays her eggs on this and other moths, be another, a, another group of, but of, of butterflies, I suppose, moths breed on it too. And you can see the tender growth on it here and very often it's the tender growth that's the most nutritious for our butterfly and moth species. So I'm just gonna take you along. Ah, now this is common hazel. Uh, Coriolis avalana is the scientific name and as you can see it's beginning to sprout. It's sprouting the leaves and it's still leggy looking. It's, it's been a cold spring and really we, we, we could do with a burst of warmth really to bring the growth along. Hazel is a very good plant for wildlife. A, a, a number of moth larvae, I think it's about 46 moth species breed on it. And just up here, under the eaves, there's a blue tit's nest. I know we're talking about butterflies, but the blue tit is feeding its young on caterpillars. So there's a link there. And its butterflies are obviously part of the ecosystem. And if we just focus carefully on that corner, we might see the blue tit coming out. It's just popped in. You can just make out a little wisp of nest material just here at the very edge. There he is, off he goes to look for more caterpillars for his young. Now, this is my gravel driveway. 
and gravel is great for sowing wildflowers, which butterflies and moths and bees and hoverflies really appreciate. So here we have some cowslips. And as you can see, they're right along against the wall. And I think I threw, I, I, what I did, I didn't actually plant any. I threw a bit of seed down. And from the seed, plants grew and self-seeded and seeded while, uh, naturally themselves. And you can see quite a display of them here. They've gone a little bit over. I'll just focus on one of the fresher ones. This plant here, you can see lovely wildflower. Not too common nowadays, they used to be everywhere. But modern farming has meant that there's really very little place left for them in, in our modern farm landscape. They, they do not withstand um, applications of, of fertilizer there's rampant grass growth and they just get crowded out. They need a fairly low open sward, open grassland in spring. And it, it, they particularly like uh, lime rich soils, which we have in, in parts of, in, in the eastern part of County Kildare and in Dublin and many other parts of the Midlands. So these are a massive oxide daisies here, as you can see. and. These flower so profusely that at night I can actually nearly find my way. There's so much white here. And this down here is a violet flower. You can see a little shy little flower here. Common dog violet is this is the name of this plant. And um, Viola Riviniana. And this plant here is a larval food plant for the silverwash fertility butterfly, the pearl border fertility and the dark green fertility. Now of those only one re really will visit a garden and that is the silverwash fertility and that's only if you have the right type of woodland and scrubland habitat with common dog violet and not many of us have that but I have had that species visiting my garden but not not very often very sporadic it's a very sporadic visitor and um, so this is still greening up as i said but it, it, it will green up and it provides you with a screen from the, the road and traffic noise to some extent too so there are practical reasons for having a hedge outside your garden now I'm just going to show you what should not be done. This is a hedgerow on, on property opposite and it's Leylandi. Now Leylandi is not native to Ireland. It's a monoculture hedge. As you can see there's only Leylandi in that hedge and really it, you, it, it might as well be plastic. It has very little wildlife value. There are a few small number of moth species that actually do feed on Leylandi, but the same moth species will happily feed on Scots pine, which is native, and, and sometimes yew, which is native. But apart from providing privacy and shelter, it has very little benefits for nature. In fact, the gold crests I saw foraging on my native hedge were actually uh, flying from that direction where they were, well, admittedly they were nesting in that, but here they were foraging here. But they'd happily nest in, in native hedging too. So please be minded that to look after butterflies, moths and biodiversity generally, you really need your planting to be native species. Th that is crucial for habitat, gen for the general ecosystem and for butterflies and moths. In particular, there are very few species that feed on, on cultivated plants or non-native plants. Except with the, with the adult stages, the the flowers they're not fussy where the, where the nectar comes from as long as it's nectar. So it, they can take nectar from non-native species. They happily do that. Now, this is the edge of the drive, and you can see here I have planted some devil's bit scabious. When I say planted, it was seed I sowed. This won't flower until 
August really and it's a tall flowering stem will come from the center here and it'll it'll reach about could reach a meter in height and they are button shaped deep blue flowers packed with nectar really really valuable for late uh, later butterflies and moths crucial nectar resource at that time of the year and a very very beautiful flowering plant as well this is an area of scrub alongside the house and uh, as you can see it consists almost entirely of native species um, my wife couldn't resist uh, this clematis here but everything else here is native there's a lot of willow hazel birch and gelder rose and also as well our friend the irish white beam now incidentally there's a starling nesting just there and I, when i was building this i deliberately left nooks and crannies for them to get into nature needs our help we, we can't take everything from nature even when we're building our houses we need to accommodate our wild creatures this is not native this is beech well there's some argument about whether it's native I, I, I'm not sure that it is however it is native to England and because we share a lot of our biodiversity with uh, our nearest neighbour we do get species that feed on this like clay triple lines which is a moth so it, it is not the worst plant to have but have it very sparingly 100% hedging consisting of beech however pretty it looks is a very limited value the idea is to have a range of plants now here is honeysuckle and again you can see it budding nicely it, it, it will flower in, in June and this flower, this the perfume is very strong at night, and it's excellent for for moths at night time. They feed on the nectar, and the, the perfume is strongest then, obviously, to attract night flying Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera means butterflies and moths. It's the order they belong to. This is a herb bed. You can, as you can see, now it's rather neglected. There's a bit of lemon balm in it and I cleaned it out a little bit earlier in spring and it's more or less been taken over by native plants so there's your common dog violet here and this leafy plant here which has finished flowering is lesser celandine beautiful shiny yellow flowers in spring and spring butterflies especially holly blue enjoy feeding on it I've even seen species like peacock small tortoise shell and comma feeding on that plant so however humble it looks it must have a, a reasonable supply of nectar in it to attract those species these are a few plants i potted and again on our theme of native plants this oak here i took as an acorn from a wood in tullamore in county offaly and that wood is believed to contain indigenous, um, long-standing native oaks, uh, peduncular oaks, or sometimes called English oak. Um, Quercus rober is the scientific name. And the reason I went there to collect the acorns is that this particular site is believed to have original Irish oak populations in it. So I wanted to take them from the most ancient site possible to assure myself that I wasn't getting say oaks that were grown from acorns imported from Germany or the Netherlands in in the, in the 19th century so these are my little oak trees and as you can see this one here is just coming into leaf and I will find a good home for these in time I've also grown some alder buckthorn here and I grow my own plants from seed from native sources. I don't buy them from garden centres because they're, they're imported. They're, they're not from native Irish provenance. So to be sure I am getting the real thing, I go into the wildest places, collect the seed and sow it myself. It's actually quite easy to do. Oak is a food plant 
for the purple hair streak butterfly. It, the egg hatches in late March to up to mid-April and this is a beautiful woodland butterfly, very rarely seen because it lives at the tops of oak trees. And you can see here I have a bed and in this bed there's a lot of common marjoram. Common marjoram flowers in midsummer. Um, it's an it's oregano is 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 what it's oregano vulgari is the scientific name and it's a lovely I'm just going to smell that beautiful smell from the, the leaf. Here it is here and the flower is a purple flower and insects really love this plant. It really is excellent. That's my devil's bit scabious. This is a riot, this area here is a riot of colour from midsummer into up to the beginning of October actually. This plant here is a St John's wort. Again, a native plant, lovely yellow flower, good for insects. And over here, I have a plant called bird's foot trefoil, common bird's foot trefoil. And common bird's foot trefoil is a larval food plant for a number of butterflies. It, it is fed on by the wood white, the cryptic wood white, common blue, green hair streak, it's, it's, and the flower, and dingy skipper, and the flower is really sought after by insects. It's a very important plant. A migrant species that we get here in varying numbers every year, the clouded yellow also breeds on common birds for trefoil and it's a late season as I said so I'm not sure I'm going to find any flowers for this plant but if I do I shall, sh I shall show it to you. Here's some more of it here and it likes to, it likes to um, abut onto dry surfaces and, and stony surfaces are very good for it and the common blue often lays on plants just abutting onto a really warm surface. Here here are some buds, flower buds just here. See the little red buds here. Not ready yet, ready in a few days time and you can see the edging there along the stone. They're bordering the stone and the gravel and that's that's ideal for butterflies for breeding and feeding. Here I have my patio area and again I have infilled those two sections with um, plants that like free draining conditions like the common bird's trefoil, the oxide daisy and the devil's bit scabious and I've done the same on this side and there's my oxide daisy there ready to burst when it gets a chance and between the paving slabs here I have let wildflowers seed themselves with a bit of help as well. I've, I've thrown seed amongst those crevices too. So I've got, again, I've got devil's bit scabious. I've got marjoram. I, I'm not sure what this is. It's a, it's not native. It's an aromatic plant. Um, this plant here is native. It's black medic. Again, uh, good nectar source and is used for breeding by the common blue. In fact, in my garden, the common blue seems to prefer breeding, laying her eggs on this plant, rather than the common bird's foot trefoil, which is just this plant here. So I don't know why they're exhibiting that preference for the black medic, but, you know, I'm here to serve them. Whatever they need is what I'll give them. Now, this is what I call my burren area and it's what it is, it's, it's a shallow area dug out and um, filled with pea gravel so it's nice and free draining and there's no pooling of water in this spot here and again full of flowers that love free draining conditions so again the oxide daisy, common birds for trefoil. I also have uh, plants that are characteristic of the burn and lo and behold one has just begun to flower this morning so we're in luck. This plant here is Bloody Crane's Bell. Beautiful, beautiful native plant. There's another one just ready to emerge there and this will be a kind of a, a deep pink glow in a couple of days time and bees really like it and butterflies 
do feed on this plant, but it seems to have a short nectar supply because they feed on it briefly, but they, they do take nectar from it. And really, it is a beautiful addition to any wildlife garden. And it's really easy, despite the fact that it grows mainly in places like the Burren and cliffs like, like Hoth Head, it, it actually does very well in gardens. It just, just don't plant it in acidic soil because it won't, it won't grow there. It needs alkaline soil. There's some common birds for trefoil, but budding there, beginning, getting ready to flower. And I also have another plant here, if I can find it. This plant is the food plant of the small blue butterfly, which is an endangered species. And there's the leaf there. And it will get considerably bigger than that. It's, a sh it's an annual or short-lived perennial. And it has a kind of a, it has a yellow flower and it blooms um, June, July, and maybe into August. There, here's another, another specimen here. And uh, it's really, really good for bees. Really good for bees. They, they really, they, they seem obsessed with it. And again, it seeds itself quite well, so you can, it, it will spread naturally. It, it won't, it won't spread into closed sward. And what I mean by that is 100% grass cover. Wildflowers find it difficult to seed themselves into stock shares. Yeah. And then um, go back into your. Can you click that there? Back in here. Mm -hmm. Knock up this one. Hello. I'm not. I'm not. I don't know what has happened there. Yeah. That's it. Um, okay. Yeah, we might go back to Jasmine's and let them, um, uh, yeah, yeah, just talk through, through a bit of that yourself, Jasmine. Um, other than that, I, I see we've loads, of, we've loads of questions. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to put up the second clip. This is a good bit shorter. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. That's the second one. So Sorry, okay. Jasmine, what, what was um, the name of that last plant that was very good for bees? Which is a they loved kidney vetch. Kidney vetch. Uh -huh. okay. Now, do you want to play it now? Yeah, I'll play it now. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Okay. So this is my native hedge, and as you can see, there are a lot of plant species in this hedge, including native crab apple. And as you can see, there's nice tender growth on it here. And I cut this hedge back hard to make sure that a lot of new growth appeared because it's the new growth that insects like to breed on. So the moth, adult moths at night come down and they lay their eggs on the most tender growing parts of the plants. And this hedgerow consists entirely of native tree and shrub species because native moths and butterflies will breed some of them only, ex uh, uh, some of them exclusively on our native plants. Now, so just to identify some plants here, this is common hawthorn. Very important plant, it produces flowers in late May, early June, which are greatly sought after by moths, particularly at night time, and butterfly species too. This is common hazel. This is common blackthorn. Um, both plants are bred on by a number of moth species. And you can see the tender growth on the hazel here. So very important to have native species and prioritize native planting in your hedges. A hedge consisting of one plant, even if it's native, will not draw in as many moth and butterfly species as a hedge which consists of a range of native plant species. You really need to, to create, to have biodiversity and have biodiversity planting, biodiverse planting as well. This here is wild cherry, grown as a hedgerow plant, not as a tree. So it's clipped back. As you can see, the hedge was cut. 
this winter. There's a cut surface there to indicate that. And the hedge needs to be managed. And I like to cut my hedge in an A shape so that it slopes to the south and it becomes nice and dense so to provide nesting opportunities for birds because you want to look after everything in your garden. This is an apple tree. Okay, uh, it's a cultivated plant, not, not native, but a lot of native species feed on the nectar. And actually there's quite a few moth species that breed on apples, the apple leaf as well, because it's cultivated from a native plant. This is the end of my garden here, and you can see the cow parsley here, very real classic uh, hedgerow plant. Um, lots of activity around it. You, if you attune your eyes, you will see the fly species around it, little midges, and there are a lot of micro moths, which are tiny, tiny moths, really, really small and they'll often breed and feed on these native plant species too. So it's important to try to replicate what's in the best of our countryside in your garden. There's a native hedge at the back. This hedge was actually planted in the 1890s, would you believe? I even have the original record. And the, 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 the man who planted it was given six pence to plant it. So a little bit of history there. So these things didn't just occur by themselves. There, there, there was a historical context for it. This was, the house was built by the, the Dunshockland Poor Law Union and, and it was given to an agricultural labourer and he was actually given the sixpence to plant the hawthorn hedging around the plant, so around the, the, the house. This is bedecked in ivy and the holly blue butterfly breeds on the ivy in late summer. She, the female lays her eggs on the developing um, holly berries and the caterpillars feed on those. Now again this is Gelder Rose and it's not flowering but it, it, it's going to as you can see there's the the flower buds there and it'd be great if I could show you that. There's a reed bed and reeds are bred on by some specialist moth species and um, the larvae often feed inside the stems. So they're very, very, very difficult to find. Now, this is my woodland. And the staple tree here is birch. You can see in the top of that birch is a magpie's nest. Great fun watching them going in and out all day long. And I'm going to bring you into the wood. And it's a little bit messy, it's not particularly tidy, but I don't think the birds and the, the butterflies and moths that use it are too bothered about that. Here's some honeysuckle here. Beautiful, beautiful scent when it flowers in June, July. And this is the cut material from the hedge. Now you might think it looks a terrible mess, and so it does, but I can't see it from the house. And the decaying wood is actually used for breeding by a number of moth species. They actually breed on dead wood. So I'm looking after all of the range of butterflies and moths that visit my garden. And here's our old friend, the stinging nettle, bred on by a number of about 18 different moth species and about four or five of our most important butterfly species as well, like the peacock, comma, red admiral, painted lady, small tortoiseshell. All of them breed on this vital plant. And here we have some hazel, which I've cut down. It, it will regrow. Hazel loves being cut. It, it, it just loves it because it, it sprouts and grows even more vigorously than before. And apparently it can grow, it can survive indefinitely if it's cut. It actually does it good. Now, here are my, it's my, my log piles are down here. And on my woodland floor, I have common dog violet, very important plant. Very, very important plant for silverwash artillery butterfly. And uh, it flowers in early spring where there's not much else flowering, so it's, it's kind of a, a cheery plant. It's, it's lovely to see it. Another woodland plant 
we're looking at it over here and again it's past its best is the humble but very beautiful primrose primula vulgaris and the early nectar is greatly appreciated by butterflies like the brimstone butterfly which look beautiful when you see them on the, the, the deep yellow males feeding on the lemon yellow of the primrose it looks lovely and bees and bees and other butterflies greatly appreciate this plant because there's not much else flowering at this time of the year now i'm going to take you through this area here and again as you can see just to take you back through it it's it's shaded and sheltered and it's a vital part of any wildlife garden if you can if you can plant some native trees do so and the other important thing is with the this native birch birch is very important about a hundred species of moth breed on birch so it's a very very important native plant crucial in fact for our native moths now, I'm going to show you a plant that's also very, very important for native moth species, and it's a plant called grey willow. And you can cut it back hard and it'll regrow. And here it is here. Now, this is grey willow. I think the count for macro moths, the larger moth species breeding on this, is 115 of our native moth species breed on this particular plant and cutting it back hard here also generates a flush of tender growth which again is favoured by um, breeding moths because they love the they love to lay on on the, the soft growing parts of the plant so the larvae get the most nitrogen for growth so that's just now this is another area of mini woodland and I'm, I'm I've actually managed to find some room in here for some oak. I don't know if you can pick those out there. And again, those are from native sources. So I'm looking after the purple hair streak butterfly, which I hope will breed on the, these plants one day. They're usually found in ver those that species usually found in very old oak woods. But I I wonder will it breed in my garden when my oaks are mature? It might. It certainly does in breed on garden oaks in the south of England, so I might be lucky and have them breeding here. So here again is a shot of the garden. Not at its best this time of the year, the meadow is yet to grow. Here's my burren, my mini burren area again. And great to see the flowers just about to come out. We're, we're not there yet, but we will be there soon. And there again, is a shot of my bloody crane's bill flower, a characteristic flower of the burren limestones, which is just this flower has just opened today. So I'm really delighted to see that. So I hope you've enjoyed the tour of my garden, and I'm going to finish up by talking about a much maligned plant, uh, the common ivy. It's an amazing plant, and some people fear it and hate it. I love it. No, it, it does need it does need to be um, it it does need to be controlled, but a bit of clipping at the right time will do that. You can see there's a flush of growth there. The ivy flowers are bred on by um, the holly blue butterfly, but the nectar is fed on by a range of butterflies and moth species in late summer and early autumn. It's a very, very important plant. And when it's dense and thick, moths and butterflies roost and, and even hibernate in it. So it's a very, very important plant for both food and for cover. So thank you very much indeed. And I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Now, do I click on stop share, uh, Donna, is it? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's great.
Um, I suppose before we get to the question, Jasmine, do, would you would you mind just taking us through kind of the life cycle of the of the butterfly? And um, that was very interesting to see where they hibernated and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, but butterflies, well, the butterflies and moths, uh, they're the same thing. Um, they both have a, they they have a four stage life cycle from egg to caterpillar or larva, chrysalis or pupa, and then the adult uh, moth or butterfly. Some some um, moth or butterfly species have what they call a rest stage in the life cycle. So, for example, in the peacock butterfly, the rest stage is the adult. The adult actually hibernates. It overwinters in log piles and in unheated buildings and sheds and so on. And it emerges in the spring and it delays breeding until the spring when the caterpillars food plants are in their best condition. So. That's the peacock, small tortoiseshell, brimstone, comma, and a number of moth species all spend the winter as adult butterflies or moths. Most don't. Most are in the immature stages during winter, like, if, for example, um, the brown hair streak butterfly is in the egg stage, the um, green hair streak butterfly and orange tip and large white and small whites, green vein whites, they're in the chrysalis stage over winter. And um, some of them are in the larval stage, the caterpillar stage over the winter, the, the brown species, the brown family of butterflies, they spend the winter as caterpillars, um, usually quite small caterpillars. And th actually when the grass growth really kicks off in spring, that's when they really put on their, their really increase in size. So um, at this time of the year, we, as you mentioned earlier, it has not been a great spring. It's been very cold. I mean, this time last year, I was getting records dozens and dozens of orange tips from people. I've seen only about half a dozen myself. I mean, it's just, it's just so cold. And butterflies hate wet and cold conditions. There should be a lot more flying at the moment than there are. And it, it, it's, it's not due to any uh, catastrophe. It's, it's simply weather. You know, it's, it's, it's simply the weather conditions. So um, most butterflies can live, most adult butterflies live a few weeks, even a few days. But two of our species, well, actually, four of our butterfly species live for several months. So, for example, the brimstone butterfly can probably can live up to a year. And there's records of the peacock living 11 months. So some of them survive a long time in the adult stage. So it, it varies a lot depending on the species. And of course, then we have species that migrate here, that fly here from southern Europe or North Africa, like the painted lady, for example and the Red Admiral. So they're, they're, the habits they have depend on the species you're talking about. That's that's great. There's a couple of questions. Do, do you mind, will we sure, yeah, to? I'll fire ahead, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Just on the on the, on the chat, um, it's, is, it, is Grey Willow, um, what's Salix vulgaris? Is that Grey Willow? It's Sa Salix cinerea. Great, right. Grey Willow, Salix cinerea. The great thing about Grey Willow is you can you can cut a stem from the hedge, stick it in the soil with no nothing, no special preparation, and just roots. You can do it even you can even do it in the midst in, in the middle of summer. It'll just root. It's it's incredible. It's the most unfussy thing to grow. It really is. It, it just it, it's 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 hassle-free propagation. Yeah, that that actually it leads me to it. Yeah, a question I was going to ask you myself because I'm a dreadful gardener. Everything dies, <laughs> and so if yeah, if you had to recommend whatever you know, whatever four or five plants, basically like that, that you could just um you know easily e that would easily grow themselves for butterflies. That it, I could just recommend to everybody that you know they would be a simple thing. What would you what would you recommend? Oh, I oh I would recommend um. Now, I, I actually have a third clip which deals with that. I don't know if we have time to show it, but you, it can be shown later, I suppose, is common knapweed. Common knapweed, if you look, it's Centuria nigra is the scientific name. That, that's an incredible plant because it's a perennial, so it, it comes up every year. It's really long lived. It has kind of pinkish flowers. It, it's multi-flowering and it flowers from June to the end of August. And when the seed is available, goldfinches flock into the garden to, to feed on them and they feed on them for weeks. So it's it's a really golden star plant for, for insects. It really is. And it's just, it's not just butterflies that are on it. Moths are on it at nighttime, hoverflies, bees, anything that likes nectar will be feeding on it. 
And because it draws in so many insects, it draws in the other animals like dragonflies and birds that eat those insects. So you're, 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 it's a great draw, that plant. I, I highly recommend it. It's really easy to grow from seed. Just tease it out of the seed head and just scatter them on bare soil and just leave it, just ignore it. It'll grow. Um, the other plant I would recommend is Devil's Bit Scabious. Now, it has a horrible name, but it's a beautiful plant. Succiza pretensis is the scientific name for Devil's Bit Scabious. And again, really long lived. Flower is a bit late, flowers later than knapweed and probably a bit longer. It flowers, say, it starts to flower in probably around mid August or a little bit before, and it flowers through to October, sometimes even November. And um, it, it's, it's multi-flowering. It's a dark blue button-shaped flower packed with nectar. And if, if you grow it against a sunny wall, you'll just get, it's just be festooned with butterflies. It, re it really is. It's, 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 I'm amazed that plant isn't in every garden center because when, when you see it in flower and you see what it does, what effect it has on insects, you, you'll just grab it off the shelf. You really will. Um, another plant I'm going to make a case for, and I'm, I'm going to try and persuade you all now on this one, is the, is the horrible common dandelion. That, that is a great plant. Now, if that wasn't a native plant and you saw it in the garden center, it was lovely golden sunflower blossoms, I bet you'd buy it. Now that, that plant flowers in April mainly. And again, there's loads of nectar in it. And again, when it finishes flowering, you know those, the, 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 the fluffy seed, the goldfinches and, and bullfinches go for the seed and green finches and linnets as well. So it's actually a really, really good plant. The leaves are also eaten by garden tiger moth caterpillars. So it's, it's a good wildlife plant. Two more, uh, common marjoram, oregano vulgari, as in oregano, the herb. That's actually a native plant. And it's a perennial as well, flowers every year, really attractive plant, a lovely smell from the leaves. You can stick it in your, you can use it in your um, pasta sa sauce as well. So it's, it's great for that. And, um, Butterflies and moths, bees love it. They really do. Dry a dry spot for that one. You know, need a nice, re, usually free draining soil. Um, if I was to recommend a fifth one, uh, it would probably be the common bird's foot trefoil. Nice rockery plant, and again, it, it flowers on and off from May to probably September. And again, it's, the, it's, a, it's, it's a nectar source for all butterflies, but it's an, also a caterpillar food plant for about five or six species of butterflies. So it's, it's really quite valuable. That, that's, that's brilliant. I've written them all down. So Thank I, you. I'll Thank give, you. Them a, give them a go. A lot of people are asking in the, in the chat there, um, how you go about collecting seeds, you know. So yeah, that's asking a great about question. It. Get yeah, grain so they dig up a little bit, or 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 if you go by collecting seeds, how do you, what do you do? Do you have to? Uh, what I what I do, how how I do it, I, I I don't dig plants up. I just I just don't do that. What I do is I I I check the flowering times for the plants. In in well, if I didn't know what the flowering times were, I would check them, and and books usually say something like four to six, which means April to June, and what you do then is. In June, you go to the plant and you, you, you'll you see that some of the flowers are gone and you'll see the, where the, the seeds are, are contained. Uh, nip it off, rub the seed out with your hands. Now you usually tell if, it's, if the seed is ready, it's usually darker. It's usually, that when the seed isn't ripe, it's usually pale green, it's darker, it's kind of brown usually when it's, so the, com the common knapweed seed is brown when it's ripe, like a tiny little chestnut. And I, I would literally collect them, put them in a, a paper bag, not a plastic one, and I would sow them as soon as I can. Uh, if, if you store seed, what it'll do is it will, um, it will actually, an inbuilt resistance to germination will kick in and it'll take a lot of weathering to break that down. So you actually want to sow it fresh. Cowslip seed does that. If you don't sow that fresh, um, there's a chemical in the seed that inhibits germination and it, you might be waiting a couple of years for it to germinate. So sow it fresh and I, I just don't bury them. Just place them on the surface. M seed needs light as well as moisture to grow. Um, it, it's okay burying an acorn or a hazelnut, but not, not, not wildflower seed. 
it doesn't get buried in the wild. So what you do is you do what it does in the wild. It lands on bare soil and germinates in that way. So I would collect them fresh. The devil's Vesavia seed, you, you go to the plant and you rub it, you, you rub it between your fingers. And if the seed comes away in your hand, it's ready. That, that's, that's the test. If you're forcing it, it's not ready. If it comes away in your fingers, it's ready. And again, just scatter it on moist, uh, on moist soil and it will grow. It doesn't need special soil. It, it will grow on, on your garden loam soils. It really will. Um, same thing if you want to sow, um, if you want to sow, uh, say, gelder rose, the berry, you, you get the berries, extract the seed from them. Anything with a berry, extract the seed from it and mix it with a mixture of compost and grit in a shallow seed tray and let the winter cold get at it. And they usually germinate that spring. Sometimes it takes two springs. Holly takes two springs to germinate but it will germinate. So um, it's, and it, it, it's sometimes a little bit hit and miss. Sometimes you get seed and you think you've done everything right and it doesn't germinate. It could be the seed wasn't viable, but usually it's pretty reliable. That's, that's brilliant. Um, somebody else was, was asking, um, Sarah was asking, can I ask please what your top picks are for small gardens? So many estates are now built with so little yeah. space. Will we pick to try and help pick up to try and um I, I would try and get a tree into it i would i would go for something like um rowan you know the mountain ash sorbus acuporia or even irish white beam sorbus hibernica they're small trees they, they really are they, they're they're very small trees they're they're let me see i mean i i've i've had i've a rowan tree in my 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 garden and it's been there 20 years and i'd say it's it's probably it's probably about 12 foot high and it's lovely lovely flowers in spring lovely berries in autumn so it's a good it's a good plant um a if you have a small garden you plant you plant a hoth do, do not plant a blackthorn in your in a small garden it, it, it will go wrong for you plant hawthorn but clip it back nice and hard you can actually be savage with it click it clip it back really hard hawthorns are very very good um wildlife plant not just not just for butterflies and moths it's a very good plant but clip it back nice and hard other small trees for gardens apart from white beam irish white beam and the um the uh, mountain ash is the holly which again you can clip common holly is very nice very attractive and it's it's native and um, so th those are the types of species i would plant in a, in a small garden Obviously, with flowers, they don't take up so much space. You can have a flower board. You can have a wildflower border. You don't have to have a wildflower meadow. You can have a border as well, and you can you have more control over what's in a border. Plant the tall ones at the back, like your devil's bit scabious and common knapweed, and in front of that, plant your medium height plants like the marjoram, and at the front, plants like common dog violet, primrose, cowslip, and um, common bird's foot trefoil. So have a have a structure to it so and they, they can all be accommodated I, I i have friends who have small gardens and they're packed with wildflowers and the neighbors all tut tut and say why don't you cut that grass you know but it's not much grass there it's all wildflower but um the the, the riot of color is just really it really is worth it and when you see the like it's built it and they come that that is the way it works and a lot of our butterflies and, and moths are, are fairly mobile if if you put if you put the infrastructure in place for them, they they will turn up. Thanks yeah, for that, gentlemen. I love the I love the idea that um of the A shape, you know that it, it you know it becomes. Uh, yeah, it's good because yeah what yeah what you want to do is you want it sloping. You the A shape the idea of the A shape is that it slopes and always try and have a west or south facing uh, aspect to your hedge, because. That's what will get the most most sunlight in the summer, and it it'll you'll you'll you really with a hedge in a garden a native hedge in a garden is just wonderful. It really is. I mean, it it hums with activity all summer long. I mean, I I have I have black caps, blackbirds, even even um, bullfinches, even wood pigeons nesting in my hedge, and just watching them going in and out. It's it's just such fun. It it really is. And also in the trees at the back of the garden, I have brown long-eared bats and they're actually landing on the trees, picking the moths off the leaves. 
So it's, you know, it, it, it really repays to plant native stuff. Now, that my poor neighbor across the road there who I embarrassed at the start of the <laughs> start of the evening, he has now promised faithfully he's going to put in a native hedge. He's promised me that. So um, once he gets planning permission from the wife, the native hedge is going in. So there you go. That's marvellous. And um, just going to, I, th I think we have about 500 questions and I have another 500 to ask you so you can be here. <laughs> you could be trapped here for the whole rest of Biodiversity Week. Um, yeah, uh, somebody was asking the best time for um, man man uh, uh, managing the ivy. Where should you be? Yeah, well, that's, that's an excellent question. Proposal. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And do you know what? When I was looking at the clip, I, I said to myself, I should have said something about that. Cut ivy, the, the best time to cut anything like a hedge or ivy is actually really in winter. And by winter, I mean February, because ivy produces berries and those berries last a long time. And what birds seem to do is they ignore them until January, then they start to eat them. And by January, the hawthorn berries are all gone. Everything else is gone. The gelder rose berries are gone. The rose hips are gone. It's, I don't know if it's a last resort to them, or it's just ready then, but that's when they eat it. So that, that's when I would clip it back. You don't want to do it in summer because the I, ivy flat, I, ivy actually has produces a lot of flowers. And not only does it produce a lot of flowers, those flowers produce masses of nectar. You can actually, you can actually put your finger on an ivy flower and lick the nectar off it. It produces that much, big, big globes of nectar. So if you ever look at flowering ivy, say in October, just stand back and stare at it. It's covered in bees and flies and wasps. And often sometimes also comma butterflies just feeding up for the winter, red admirals as well, feeding up for their migration. So that's when it's really at its best. And also, and, and particularly, funnily enough, the holly blue butterfly, see, prefers breeding in people's gardens than the countryside. It really does. It's one of these weird butterflies that's actually happier in a built up area than it is in a rural area. And I, the reason for that is it loves ivy draped over a wall because it's hot. And the larvae develop really quickly in hot conditions. And also it encourages ants and the ants actually look after the larvae. They, they mind them because the larvae produce um, a sugary secretion that the ants feed on. So the ants take care of them and protect them from parasites. So. You, you really want to let the ivy flower. So let it, let it flower and you'll, you'll get the holly blue uh, feeding on it. And I, I know several gardens in, in the middle of Dublin, even say, I, I've even seen that butterfly say on Lord Edward Street and on the Keys, right in the center of Dublin and in the center of Cork. So it's really, it's, an, it's the ultimate garden butterfly really. Um, Jasmine, a lot of people are asking about garden centres. Is it very bad to buy from garden centres and, and what, you know, some people think they could they, be... Well, look, if you, want, if you want a hebe, which is not native, it's from us in New Zealand. If you want a hebe and you see, and, and you know it's good for butterflies, that's grand, that, that's fine. Don't buy a native plant from a garden centre and expect it to be from Irish provenance, because almost certainly it isn't. It, it's just not the, the the growers the growers aren't the growers aren't here they're in the Netherlands they're in Germany the, those plants you see with you know cowslip primula veris yeah it, it is primula veris but it's not an Irish one and you might think well why is he on about that for plants in Ireland are not exactly the same as plants in continental Europe there are often genetic differences between them just like there are between, say, the Irish marsh artillery butterfly and the Irish and the marsh artillery butterfly in the north of England, there's a genetic difference, and there's certainly a genetic difference in the Irish marsh artillery and the one in France. So, if you bring in lots of native plants, you buy in a garden centre, plant them out, and they escape into the countryside, and they start being, they start bees obviously are are, are flower, flying from flower to flower, pollinating them. You're going to get a weakening of the Irish, um, the, the genetic strain of the Irish plant, because it, it will just breed with the, the non-native stuff. And that that's that's I think that's to be avoided, really. You want to maintain the genetic integrity of our flora. Um, because don't forget that genetic differences often reflect 
the, the plants um, evolving in the conditions that we have here. So those plants have developed in ways that cope best with their environment and also have evolved in ways that respond to the other things in their environment, like the butterflies and bees that use them. So it's best to get native seed. It, re it really is. Um, very, very few plants in garden centres were, were, are grown from Irish seed, if any. Um, uh, just, just back to the, the garden, garden centres again. Um, are these butterfly houses and things of the soil? Are, are they selling us rubbish or do these things actually work? And also the stones and that that you get in, in butterflies, is there, should, that you, you're, you know, that, that you have for your, your garden, should there be a particular size? Is bigger, better or? Um, no, the, the, sto the stones, the, the, the st stones are an, a an abiotic element in the garden. They're, they're non-living. What butterflies do with them, they actually, they're actually very useful for butterflies because what they do is they use them for basking. That, all insects are cold-blooded, so they need to heat up to become active. So you sometimes see a butterfly in sort of cloudy conditions with the wings fully expanded, lying flat against a stone. It's actually trying to heat up. So stones are very important. Also, some butterflies will only breed on plants that grow partly onto a bare surface like a stone because, because of the heat generated. So the common blue, it, it's, it's actually, it's not breeding on the plants in my, in my meadow, it's actually breeding on the plants growing in the, rock, in the rocky areas because they're warmer. Um, the butterfly houses, I am, I'm actually not familiar with what that is. I don't know what they are. If 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 you can tell me what they are, Donna, I, I can comment on them. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just. I literally, I'm just looking through the uh, the comments here. Um, actually, I just see another comment that it said that uh, dandelions are really taking off for sale in Singapore. So we could all get suddenly very rich here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I was talking to an Australian girl once, and she was saying to me, "What is all this stuff?" She was talking about gorse. And she thought it was absolutely amazing. And I, I thought to myself, we're not mad about it here. <laughs> but I, I, you know, you, you, you get the point. People want what they, they see something in some other country and they think it's in incredible. And you're looking at it thinking, why do you think that? But no, it's, it's um, dandelions really are, they really are a great plant. It breaks my heart to see people spraying them. And I, I every time I see someone spraying along a, a country verge, I, I've seen people spray cowslips. I've seen, I've gone along later and seen dead bees beside it. You know, it's, it's awful, really, really not good. To be honest, I think it's really antisocial. I, I think it, it's that, it's, I'm that annoyed when I see it. And it's not good for the environment. And you ever notice a sprayed area, you'll never see a bird there. It's, it's very true. And I just see, it was actually, I'm just looking at the, the chats there, it was Tamara Van Rie that had asked about the butterflies. Um, did, you know, uh, she said, did the little butterfly houses that I sold in garden centres actually make sense? Do they offer anything for butterflies? Do they use them or do you, put, do you need to put something in them? No, you, you, I, I don't know what the product is, but to be honest, uh, look, butterflies will fly into your house, like tortoiseshell butterflies hibernate in people's houses. Sometimes peacocks do as well. I mean, I, I've, I, I have my clothes hung up on a rail and some mornings in, in September, I go there and there's a peacock on it, especially if it's a dark. So I'm, I'm wearing a dark jumper at the moment, there'll be, be, be a peacock sitting on it, you know, because they, they, they're attracted to things that look similar color to their undersides because they'll spend the winter there. If you grow the right type, like I have a patio area just outside my back door and there's loads and loads of wildflowers. You saw with the burny, little burny bit, as I call it, in, in August, September, I just sit there and just stare at the butterflies all day long. You don't need a contraption to bring butterflies into your into your environs. They'll come in if you, you grow the right plants with them in nice, warm, sunny conditions, and they will turn up. They, they really will. Um, if, if the idea of a butterfly house is to keep them over the winter, the ones that come into your house to hibernate, the best thing to do is take them out of the heated rooms and put them in an outheated, in an unheated room or an outhouse and leave them there till March and then let them go in the sunshine in March. That's the best way of managing butterflies that go into your homes. Because what those butterflies do is they come in in September, when you turn the central heating, heating on in October, they wake up thinking it's spring. 
So you, you, you just catch them and put them in an, uh, out of the light in an unheated situation and they'll calm down and they'll resume their sleep. And that, that's the, I, I'm always getting queries on tortoiseshell butterflies there. I really am. Um, next question, Donna. Next question. <laughs> Um, does it, from uh, Charlie is asking to ask, would you tell us some more about propagating kidney vetch? And uh, somebody right. else was asking where, where you get native marjoram. Right, kidney Charlie, kidney vetch is a plant that really likes stony or sandy places. So sand dunes are great places to find them. They they really won't grow in garden soil. You need you throw them onto a, a gravel patch or a rockery. That's where they'll grow for you. And what you do is the flowers are coming to the end in, in, um, in July. So what you do is the seeds are kind of held in kind of a little papery thing. They're black and flat and dry. Just pick them and just literally sprinkle them on your, um, on your, your sandy or gravelly soil and forget about them. Forget you ever put them there. Like literally walk away and forget about them and they'll come up that's literally that's what you do you just abandon them and they they'll they will they will appear and um, but bees just bees are just obsessed with the plant they, they really are I, I don't know what it is but they just go mad for it and uh, it's 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 a yellow kind of a frothy looking flower as well but it's a really really nice plant it's low growing as well so it's it's not it's not very intrusive but it does need really poor soil really free draining su substrates it, it'll grow in sand like it, it literally the, the poorer the soil and the freer draining it is the better um marjoram where do you get it um well you there's loads of it along the canal between comfy and uh league slip there's masses of it there sunny warm free draining conditions the burn is packed with the stuff um it likes it, it. It usually likes limey soil, dry conditions. Again, get the seed, just break break up the dead flower head in your fingers and chuck it on your dry on your gravel area or your rockery and walk away. Forget about it. Literally, just forget it. It'll come up, and it lives for years and years. You don't you don't have to bother letting it trying to get re, reseeding from it. It'll just seed itself anyway. Any any um, seeding you want to do in a meadow. If you're growing a wildflower meadow, you must, wildflower seed, even in a plant that's established in a meadow, it won't seed itself in a closed sward. You need to rake the soil back, rake the vegetation off it to create, like scratch the surface to, to, so the seed can fall into, in, onto soil, not onto other vegetation. That's what you, that's what you'd need to do if, if it was so, if, if you were sowing wildflower seed into a, a into an established lawn it won't grow in an established lawn you have to scrape it back to soil even rough raking will do will do some of that you want to do a bit of damage to the grass that's what you want to do you want to rake it back and do not fertilize your lawn if you do you won't get wildflowers yeah, that, that's great i'll just i'll just give you whatever two last um questions uh, jasmine because yeah. uh, you, 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 yeah, otherwise you'd be, you'd be stuck here for the rest of your life. Um, uh, one, one from Bree Dean, and she asked, what can you grow in dark areas, dark corners? To, to dark like corners, dark corners grow cowslip. No, sorry, sorry. Grow primrose, grow common dog violet, grow a, let me see. Um, funnily enough, devil's bit scabious will grow in dark corners. Fun, oddly enough it will i've even seen it growing in woods and um, let me see other dark corner plants um red campion is a beautiful plant to grow in a dark spot really lovely lovely flower and um, red campion if you see it you'll 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 really like it and uh, bluebells native bluebells are growing in a dark corner and um, wooden enemies wild garlic they'll all grow in dark corners because they're woodland plants so they're used to shade that's great. And, and the other thing, and I will end with the last one, though I also have a question as well. So uh, first of all, what, what seeds can you harvest now um, from May to June? The seed now, so, yeah, hmm. go, go and have a look for primrose. Some of that will have already flowered. There are still some flowers left, so you'll be able to find the plant. And what you do is uh, 
when you feel the base of the where the flower was swollen, it's usually a sign the seed is ready. And what you do is just just break it off, and you get this it's round black. It's it the, the seed is circular and black, kind of little hard little seeds. Um, blue bells in a in a couple of weeks time, you were able to get the seed from those. Also from um, common dog violet as well. Again, the seeds are kind of dark, little dark seeds. Basically, the 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 obviously common dandelion as well. Basically, anything that flowered in spring. They're, they're the types of plants you would you would go for seed now, and look at where the plant was growing in the wild before deciding what where you're going to put it. I mean, there's 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 very little point to say planting marjoram in a really deep shade. It, it's it's not going to grow. You know, have a look at what have a look at where you found it. If you see something on a top of a tall hedge bank, it's usually a plant that likes lots of dry uh, soil. So try and put that in a dry situation. That's uh, that's great. Um, and just one minute, it's, it's great being the chair. You can actually get your own questions when you know, <laughs> you're running out of time. I, I'm just dying to know, um, Jasmine, um, how high do butterflies um, uh, fly? You know, I'm always looking. How high do they fly? Yeah, um, maybe I'm missing ones that please, you know? It depends on the species. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's been a, there's, there was a study done at Rothamsted Research in England to find out what was going on with the painted lady and the, the height they were finding that it was at least a kilometre up. Wow. Yeah. Also, um, so in some species, the mobile stage is the caterpillar. So in some tussock moths, they have found them floating in the outer atmosphere. It's actually the caterpillar that migrates, not the adult moth. So, you know, they're amazing. They really are. Astronauts. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, the astronauts were, were just saying. Astronaut, astronaut, yeah. But the outer out atmosphere, yeah. yeah. Astronaut butterflies. This is just, this is just amazing. Listen, thank you so much, Jess. You're very welcome. Everybody, thank you. Everybody is saying thank you. It's just absolutely That's inspirational and fascinating. And, and I, I, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll be uh, 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 plaguing you to come back again. Uh, we'll plague away. Very <laughs> chance, yeah. Um, just I, I, as regards for, for everybody else here as well, um, we'd, we'd just send an email from Green Foundation Ireland. And if you want to be on our mailing list, it'd be, it'd be very short, um, whatever. I don't know, like five questions or something, and then we can let you know about our all our all our other events that are going to be happening. Our next event is at the end of June. It's on food sovereignty, climate action, and, and regional resilience, and it'll be held. It'll be um, uh, take place with Cultivate Ireland. Everything nearly now is happening on Zoom, um, and uh, uh, yeah, and hopefully at, at in October we'll have a Minolta Goes Wild festival. So we'll have a kind of a wildlife festival happening in. Uh, in, in County Meath. So, um, yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Jasmine. It's just, it's Thank you, and thank you everybody for listening. I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to, to everybody. And please do try out some of the things I, I've talked about. And I think Donna, I don't know if Donna will make, have the video available for people to check back on. There's another clip as well you can look at, which covers the wildflower meadow itself. It does work. I promise you there's nothing, absolutely nothing special about the soil in my garden. There really isn't. And it this this works. This is a conservation job anybody can do in a garden. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Take care, everybody. God bless. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.